it is now 634 and I will call to order a meeting of the Deerfield Planning Board and ask Kathy Sylvester to read the introduction. This meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation in accordance with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, which extend the governor's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGLC 30A and 20 until March 31st, 2023. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual broadcast unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in any specific item on this agenda should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. For purposes of in-person attendance, the Town of Deerfield will, will host the meeting in the main meeting room of the Deerfield Municipal Offices with remote participation details noted below. Thank you very much. Um, so a reminder of our meeting guidelines to speak one at a time, follow our Deer Deerfield Code of Conduct to be respectful, considerate, courteous, and also, especially because we have quite a full agenda tonight, to be concise, non-repetitive, and re recognized by the chair. Uh, board members in attendance, and I think I can see who's who here. Uh, did Rachel Blaine just get up from her chair? I think no, she I'm right here. Oh, she's at that end. Rachel Blaine. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> Denise Mason. Denise Mason here. Uh, Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester here. Uh, Kathy Watroba. Kathy Watroba here. And Emily Gaylord. Emily Gaylord here. Emily Wolfkull here. And Andrea Liebson is um, missing tonight. Here. Over the skies of uh, Ford Chicago. Um, minutes. So we have um, three sets of minutes. Uh, Rachel, do you want to um, introduce those or? Um, oh, I've been a busy bee. You have been. <laughs> Who was the other one that? Had... Is this December as well? Well, we had December okay. uh, yeah, 12, 5, 1, 9, yep. and 2, 6. Yep, yep, yep. So December is, yeah. Anybody? I've looked at them a lot. <laughs> I mean, so, I, I I'm certainly noticed. I mean, there's a, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go on, please. I was just saying that the there is some, um, uh, we at the, um, February meeting read the anti-hate statement in and there were just some glitches there because I did it off the recording. And so I'm gonna correct that. Um, I had a name wrong, but I think it's been adjusted uh, in the, the name of the, yeah, who, Bouquillon, I know how to say that in French, but I, it, it came out a hundred, hundred different ways. It is actually really nice when we're in person to get a card from some of those people, just so that I have that, but that, cause that just causes me more research. And that one I just could not find, but there it is. So I present three sets here. Can I make a comment? Yes. That's Kathy. So the first set doesn't have a date on it, <clears throat> but it does say pursuant to a notice duly filed with the town clerk, a meeting of the planning board was held July 11th, 2022. And I'm not sure if that's yep, supposed that's to an be error. That's, I think that's, that was the same intro for all of them. Yeah. And I'm not sure if that's right. I mean, is that supposed I, to be I like didn't, that? I, I will, I'll talk to Amy about oh. that, but I didn't, it's um, the ninth is the ninth is dated correctly, and so is in January is this dated correctly, and so is yeah. February's. I even did the footer. See how cool that is. But what I'm saying is in the first paragraph. Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm not sure why that says July 11th on each one. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, it was probably just a cut and paste. Yeah, it is definitely. Yeah, a cut okay. And paste. So I thought so, but um, just wanted. To, and then, um, thank you. Yeah. And then just there were some other, um, you know, spelling and small correction. So, um, well, I make a motion to uh, accept the minutes with corrections. Well, 
Yeah. The important thing is that the corrections get done, if, yes. especially if they're not just my bad spelling. What's the best way should we go about that, Rachel, with um, sending them to you or sending them to Amy? No, to Amy, because um, okay. like I format, I formatted the ninth and the, the, I formatted January and February, but I didn't format December, for example. Okay. I, so, um, or at least I didn't make it look like this. So I think it's best to send them to Amy. Okay. I'll talk to, I'll give Amy a, an email. Sounds good. She Do you want to she deal on? with, she's right there. Spelling errors here. No, um, Jason, or, no. Um, yeah. this is with us tonight. You better know it by now. Um, oh, yeah. don't believe you. <laughs> that is not my strength. Um, I, I spell Annalie's name and Andrew's name out and I put it on my computer in a sticky note. Just that way. <laughs> that's how I'll. That's a strategy. Ask Ms. Petrova. She'll tell you all about it. Minor details. So February number six, the so, second line. You want to say site plan permit, I think. Oh, I think that is important. Yeah. Number nine. Six. Second line. Oh, second. Of number six under February. Um, under the old site, business. Slate plan. You mean as opposed to slate plan? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you got it. Thank you. And that's actually should be capitalized too. And my only other substantive thought was on um, February 6th, number 13, when we're talking, I think it's number 13, right below with Ember Gardens. Um, it's that they have elected not to pursue further their operations rather than, I forget exactly how it says, because we're not just waiting for Amber Gardens, they, yeah, they bowed out. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me what it says. Amber Gardens says has not submitted. Actually, that's a super, that's not even what I wrote. So, okay. Uh, I'll <laughs> check back with Amy about that because she must have. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Oh, it says Amber Gardens has not submitted. submitted. But uh, that's not what I wrote. It wasn't submitted because they're <laughs> bowing out. Because <laughs> they're not existing. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, um, Denise, you made a motion to um, approve all three sets of minutes uh, pending corrections. Was that it? Yes. Excellent. Okay. I'll second it, Kathy Sylvester. Thank you, Kathy. Any other discussion? Uh, so, Emily? Emily Gaylord, aye. Kathy? Kathy Wachoba, aye. Kathy? Kathy Sylvester, aye. Denise? Denise Mason, aye. Rachel? Rachel Lane, aye. Emily Wolf, aye. So, um, this is it. approved unanimously, 600. Zero, zero. All right. So, old business. Um, we do have a continuation of our um, accessory apartment bylaws. As a reminder, we do have three um, continuations of public hearings today. Um, the bylaws are a little bit different from the other situations where people are appearing, um, but a reminder that um, uh, Kathy will be presenting potentially a brief overview, then we will have an opportunity for public comment the board does not respond individually to um, to issues raised in public comment uh, when uh, public comment is closed and the board is having their discussion. Um, then we can address some of the issues that were brought forward in public comment, and then we um, have a vote on uh, potential changes or and or how to send these bylaws forward either for more public comment, more discussion, or um, onto the warrant. So, Kathy, Sylvester? So, um, our accessory apartment bylaws have, basically, they're um, no longer valid, so we wanted to redo it. <laughs> they, I, I, what is the proper term? They, they expired. They're, they're passe. So, um, <clears throat> 
we have it's been going on since before I was on the planning board. Um, the purpose is primarily to a couple of things help people stay in their home so they could rent space um, as an accessory apartment to help with income or with someone to help them with childcare if they have young kids or help them as they get older to be able to stay in their home um, and to increase some housing opportunity for young people who may not be able to afford to buy in Deerfield. Um, a couple of points I would say is that we're trying to go for a two thirds majority on the town uh, warrant. Um, and by that, we could have opted to choose language that the state offers saying um, the accessory apartment will be half the square footage of the main house or 900 square feet, whichever is less. And we would only need um, a simple majority to pass that at the town meeting, but we felt that was too restrictive. So we're going for a 900 square foot or less ADU which will require two thirds vote uh, at town meeting. And we're hope we have the support for that. Um, yeah. What I'll say now too, is since I'm um, remote and can't quite see the participants in town hall or actually even the, the Zoom screen, I've asked uh, Vice Chair Denise to moderate the um, public comment time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So now we're having public comments. So if there are people who care to speak, they can raise their hand and Denise will moderate all of that. Please raise your hand or come up and I think the people come might up want to, see to the mic, face. please, and put your name and- I already done that. You did, thanks, Pam. Okay, and everyone has uh, two, two minutes, so I'll be timing you. And is this live? Excuse me? Is this live now? It is, if you could pull it closer. Okay. Um, you won't need it in the timing. Excuse me, do you want me to time with your, oh, sure. Yep. Good evening, my name is Pam Predmore, 36 Graves Street. Um, I also am the newest member of the Ad Hoc Town Senior Committee, uh, Senior Housing Committee. And I also <clears throat> am retired from the Amherst Housing Authority where I managed public housing, including senior housing. So I get the need, I'm hearing as a member of the ad hoc committee about the need for it. I know people in town who are in danger of losing their homes because they can't afford to stay. They are over housed. They can't afford to stay there anymore. Um, and so I see the need for this. And I also remember when a former neighbor um, was selling their house and, and one of the people who wanted to buy it wanted to create housing for her disabled father and, and was not able to do that yeah. because of the, re the restrictions on ADUs. So um, I applaud your plans for this. Um, I hope that if this passes because I certainly see the need um, not just for elders to have some place to live or for people to potentially have child care available, um, care available for a younger disabled member of their family. There's so many reasons mm -hmm. why this option is needed, um, not the least of which that most, a lot of people in town, as we've discovered on this committee, and I'm not speaking for the committee, please let me make that clear, but um, we heard from people who there's no way they could rent a place here in town. Mm -hmm. That's simply impossible. Um, I, I know someone who's working with Life Bath because they can't afford where they're living and they're going to have to move and can't find anything. So thank you very much for the work you've been doing on this. Um, I sincerely hope that this passes at town meeting. And um, if there's outreach that can be done, that you'll be doing that. So make sure that gets passed at town meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Pam. Okay, we have um, Lily Dwight. <clears throat> yes, thank you, uh, Lily Dwight, 
<clears throat> South Mill River Road. I serve as the chair of the Ad Hoc Senior Housing Committee with Pam. Thank you, Pam. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to give a little history. The original backyard ADU was done by the Ad Hoc Senior Housing Committee 20 years ago. <laughs> Is it 20 years ago? I think it might be. Yeah. And that was because and it was much more restrictive than we wanted, but it was the only way to get it <clears throat> approved by the town with that five year sunsetting. Um, so I am so pleased that you all are doing this. I applaud the idea of enabling uh, people to do it as a disconnected um, accessory dwelling unit. I will say that my sister, who has a son with Down syndrome, has and lives in Florence, has built a small accessory dwelling unit, which has it's like 850 square feet and has two bedrooms and two baths, and it's absolutely beautiful. And so her son can live there with um, a companion who doesn't have to be a super caregiver. Um, but at least someone that she's comfortable with and he has his independence. So there are lots of ways in which this benefits so many members of our community. And I absolutely want to second Pam's comment about, and, and actually, um, Kathy, when you were introducing it, the need for, we need workforce housing. We need housing that people can afford to live in in this town of all ages. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lily. We have others who want to speak. Mr. Decker, back to the mic. You want me to come up here? Please. I will. Okay. I, I had the pleasure of working with this subcommittee, and I thought it was uh, pretty enlightening and what have you. A uh, couple of things that uh, is, it should be made clear is if somebody applies for the detached structure and the planning board turns it down, what is the appeal process? Is it, can the person go to the zoning board of appeals or do they have to go straight to court? Okay, so that should, that should be made clear uh, up front. The uh, biggest problem with, with this whole thing is uh, making sure that there's adequate uh, septics available and that the wells are far enough apart if there's a separate well and that sort of thing. And so those things are basically the Board of Health. But when I was on the planning board probably 50 years ago, uh, we came up with the uh, fact that you needed 12,000 square feet and 100 feet of frontage in order to build a house. And if you didn't, if you had both utilities, if you had neither, it was 125 and uh, uh, additional number of square feet. I think it might have been 25. And if it was, uh, if you had none, it would have, I think, been 150 and 40,000 square feet. Prior to that being put in, uh, anybody could have put as much as six buildings on an acre of land. And at the time, there was a big piece of property in Mill River that had been sold. And uh, the developers were around and about. And uh, that's why that those dimensions were put in. It was to try to uh, slow the growth down a little bit and make sure whatever was built uh, wasn't going to be a problem down the road. And there was, there was a moratorium at one point uh, that was proposed by the planning board. Uh, it didn't pass town meeting, but it slowed things down enough so that people, could, you could straighten out some stuff. So that, those are my concerns. And uh, I think if this thing doesn't pass, uh, one of the things in this article is if it doesn't, if it passes, you're going to eliminate the current section, which isn't effective now at all, mm -hmm. because it had a sunset date. So if you turn around, but if this doesn't pass, you want to leave yourself the leverage uh, and the ability to extend the date four or five years down the road so you can continue to work on the pro program or what you wanted to accomplish and make sure that you handle anybody's concern. Those are my concerns. Uh, I've had other concerns with, with other parts of the zoning bylaw that you people seem to want to ignore, okay? And I've told your board about it before. 
but I think that uh, those things need to be done. The other thing is uh, yeah. you've made several changes to the zoning bylaw in the last few. If you can wrap it up. Yeah, I'm going to. Thanks. You've made several changes in the zoning bylaw in the last few years, but is there a compilation of all those zone change in a binding book that somebody can go in and look and read and not have to read it online with cut and splices and, and everything else? Is there a book been published of the zoning bylaws so people can go in and see a comprehensive list of what all the bylaws are? Because I haven't looked in the last week or two, but I don't think that the there was a couple overlay districts that were passed, and I don't know if they're in the in the booklet. And uh, so I think what you ought to do is be getting an appropriation from the town meeting uh, to do that work and get it done so people have the information available. Other than that, it's a lot of work. People listen. Sometimes they don't. But, you know, <laughs> you just put it forward and let it die or pass. And uh, you don't bring it up. It's never going to happen. All right. Thank you. Point. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Decker. Do we have anyone else who'd like to come up and speak? Okay. Mr. Brennan, if you can fill your name out. Yes, please. Will do. Uh, Mark Brennan, 66 Boynton Road. Uh, I just wanted to come uh, up in front of the board and uh, say thank you for, you know, considering doing this. This was a passion of mine, one of the reasons why I ran for the planning board. Um, our uh, town has been able to kind of keep its uh, look and feel from what I remember as a kid by uh, preserving land through APR funds. But one of the downsides is that we haven't been able to really build at scale. So this is a, you know, I think a great solution for keeping people in their homes and having a, you know, a, a sane amount of building without losing the look and feel for Deerfield. So I wanted to say thank you for that. The one comment that I do have on this, however, is we do have some folks with non-conforming lots all over town. Our town is old. Building has, you know, changed zoning um, bylaws and everything have changed uh, dramatically over the years. Um, I would uh, just want to call out the one section that talks about the, uh, um, the, the, the piece about having uh, the, the setback requirements met. Um, I, I could anticipate someone who, you know, maybe just miss it, you know, by a few feet, but having a, you know, we, we see it all the time in, in certain parts of town where you've got a lot that's kind of narrow, but goes back really far, you know, where they might, might be a little too close for one of the setbacks. So having some sort of mechanism where someone who might have, you know, an acre plus more than enough land um, in, and everything to build an accessory apartment, um, but you know, not being able to because of a, a setback just on one side would would be kind of rough. So um, that would be my only comment. But again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Brennan. All right. Anybody else in the audience who would like to know? Anybody else online? Any more comments? I don't see any. So then perhaps what we would do now is, is the planning board in agreement to close the public <clears throat> public comment period, at which point then we can um, have some, well, have some of our own discussion. I move, I so move, Rachel Blaine. I second that, Denise Mason. <laughs> so uh, any, uh, discussion? Any further discussion? Um, um, Emily, we'll just go around the table that way. <laughs> Emily Gaylord, yes. Kathy Wichoba, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Emily Wichoba, yes. So we'll close our public comment period <clears throat> and have discussion amongst the planning board in relation to this bylaw. So, Annalee, uh, in regards to Mr. Decker's comment about detached buildings and what happens if we turn it down, I mean, mm -hmm. it would seem that you get a special permit if it's detached to make sure that it meets the setback requirements, is my understanding that it meets the square footage requirements that, you know, things such as that. 
if it if those things were met, I don't know how we would be turning it down. Mm -hmm. Am I missing something here? So I think that this actually goes to Mr. Brennan's um, yes. um, comment that those kind of setbacks on on non-conforming lots might end up being something that is complicates the structure. I, I mean, I'm just imagining that that's really the the holdup. Because um, the special permit is um, only in RA and CBRD, not in the, I mean, so it's a, a non-issue for most of the others, for all of the others. Um, I think that's probably the I, I think also, too, wasn't the question, what would be the appeal process if we feel that setbacks need to be followed yeah. or... Um, that most people were not pleased with us. <laughs> Part of the reason that was put in was because of a resident that came to one of our meetings, maybe you remember, Mr. Decker, I think you were there, who was concerned about the setback. So in a case such as Mr. Brennan's uh, case where you, you might have an acre lot, but right. it's thin and long, I mean, are we allowed to provide a waiver in certain cases where it makes sense if you have already discussed it you know sent out letters to neighbors where they could so but that would, i think that the the issue here is then we would no we wouldn't give a waiver but, but they could appeal to the zba mm -hmm. uh, through an appeal process um which is more in the purview of the zba i see and um because we're kind of holding up the the integrity of the regulation. So if the ZBA was the board that then got into the nitty gritty of a particular lot. Um, and so there was an appeal process, you know, better than going to court. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> better than. than uh, and then the ZBA could give a waiver and that, and or an ZBA, exception or whatever yeah. in that case. Whatever um, they do. Wait, their magic wand. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea, but I mean, I think that that's the that's the process by which, and and I think um, you know what are the considerations too? Because we are just looking at setbacks, right? So exactly. We, we have very we have very clear considerations. We talked about it a lot last time. Um, I liken it to a fifty-five mile an hour speed limit. You know what? Fifty-seven is too high. Uh, you got to you got to pick a number. You got to go someplace in order to create any sense of order. And um, so we we can see all sides of different permutations and different shifting around of numbers. Uh, but we just had to put a pin in it mm -hmm. and say this right. is where we're going to stand. Um, and there may be um, changes in the future if we find a problem. I mean, right. we can't always foresee the problems until they happen and they go, oh, uh, that unintended consequence. Maybe we need to revisit this. And, and, well, uh, and Kathy, that's why we're doing this now because we found that our old ones were so antiquated. So this is the next best attempt at you know addressing the situation. So we essentially don't have a bylaw right now for ADU. Right. Well, right. So that's my other question, just quick yeah. on the other, um, should this not pass? What is the process by which we then try to re-up our, our old, do we put another warrant in that says in the event that this did not pass by two thirds vote, you know, warrant number 12, then 12 prime. Here's the thing we'd like you to vote on is to extend the, the uh, warranty a bit on mm -hmm. our current bylaws, which are already expired. I don't know, Annalise shaking her head. That may be that would be that <laughs> that well, for, for council. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm wondering. My thought would be that um, we don't essentially have an ADU bylaw now. Uh, there's a good likelihood that in October we'll have another town meeting, annual town meeting. And if there's a lot of dissent at this town meeting, then we'll take that back to the drawing board and potentially bring forward a different version in October, which is only what, three, four months after this one. That's Don't do that to me, okay. <laughs> please. <laughs> I just, right. you know. I mean, there is an argument for just 
laying out what happens. So like people know going into it, okay, if I am in a non-conform, non-conforming, conforming, <laughs> but um, what do I do? And just having some like explicit understanding around like that would go to the ZBA. Just, I think it's helpful for folks to know what hits our board versus what hits the ZBA mm -hmm. and being really clear about that up front <laughs> um, and that it's not a non-starter if someone's in a situation that doesn't fall directly in line with this. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that something that needs to be written in the bylaw? Yeah. So I have to do this again? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> there, Bob has some, Bob has some, some, um, I'm sorry. Some wisdom. We could get Mr. Decker to do it. This, this line here, the first line of the proposal for member. tonight, this section replaced in its entirety section 2244, which shall be deleted with the adoption of the, of the new uh, section. Right. You can have that as a separate article and uh, and also, or any any other related there too, where you can turn around and put a, a new date in to the existing section with an amendment on the floor. Uh, to extend it three or four years while you work on it. And that way it, it solves part of the problem going forward. Right. Uh, and it doesn't blanket keep everything at a, at a halt. Because I know there's at least one structure in town that there was a zoning hearing on. I didn't participate in it. Uh, that uh, the house has been built, but the second kitchen has never been included. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I would think that people want to see accessory apartments within limits, but they want they don't want to cart launch everything in its brother. Yeah. Because it, some of these things need to be tweaked and uh on a case by case basis. But if you if you extend the date, then we the zoning board can handle it because that goes to that section goes to the zoning board of appeals. And in the past the, the zoning board of appeals has granted permits for, for accessory units. Right. Uh, in one case, uh, I think somebody had an, an amputation and what have you, and they, had, they came in and the board granted it. So, you know, I, so it's not hard and fast, but you want to have some flexibility mm -hmm. and, and you don't want to cripple the, everything up front. That's fine. That's why I came to them just to tell you. All right. Thank you. Annalie is uh, trying to get our attention. Annalie. <laughs> I'm wondering if um, in, in an effort to provide the clarity, but not necessarily stall this going forward, if what we might consider is um, uh, approving the bylaw for the warrant pending town council's um, recommendations about this, the appeal process. Yep. Hi. Hey. Yeah, we got Can you that. Please mute your. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who was speaking, but yeah. Okay, Annalie, are you? I'm I'm done. Thank you. Oops, take down my little hand here. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's down. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So I do want to ask maybe Rachel what you think about. I mean, this bylaw isn't meant to necessarily affect legacy ADs, right? Correct. So they're kind of legacied in, yep. exactly, right? Yep. No. Previously, what is that called? Previously non nonconforming. Yeah. So it's only from th this date mm -hmm. forward, if you're building an ADU, it needs to conform to this bylaw. Anything prior that may not conform is a legacy ADU. Right. Yes. And in the event of a shift, then that's going to be an awkward moment, the shift of, of uh, ownership. Ownership, yeah. But that's, it is what it is. And that might be another reason to have a, an appeal process, just because mm -hmm. if there's been an ADU, uh, undocumented ADU, and um, there's a shift in ownership, and the new owners want to, then so that would be another. I think you might understand this better than me. Maybe you could help me yeah. with moving forward to tell exactly the town council what we're looking yeah. for. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Anybody want to make a motion? So, do we need to? Yes. Well, um, 
we we would either continue the public hearing to our next meeting, which might be sooner rather than later, or we could vote on this bylaw, <clears throat> approving this bylaw um, with the inclusion or with the recommendations as stated by town council regarding the appeal process. I go for that. Did you just make that motion? <laughs> I am too. I think that's I think that's very sensible. Yeah. I think we have kicked this can down the road right. a lot. Yeah, no I think kidding. To let Kathy off the hook, but also not to that this is a it's a good this is something that actually doesn't have anything to do with regulations. It has to do with process. And so if we um did you just make a motion, Annalie? Well, um I guess I move that. Uh, we approve this bylaw for inclusion on the town meeting warrant um, pending town council's review of the appeal process, mm -hmm. review and potential edits regarding the appeal process. I second that, Rachel yeah. Blaine. Emily Gaylord, yes. All right, we need to go through. She just, Emily just voted yes. <laughs> Kathy Wadroba. Yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Emily Wolfcool, yes, thank you. All right. And I think at one of our previous meetings, um, Emily and Kathy, you were going to, uh, Kathy Sylvester, uh, work on a um, info sheet for town meeting. So we'll just- yeah. We just needed to get this far so we knew what the information was. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so one public hearing out of three. Um, our next uh, public hearing continuation is for the VESH. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes. That was the interesting thing we did all night. <laughs> the um, VESH parking lot and CT scan. Uh, situation um and my phone is somehow ringing or someone's phone is ringing but in any event um so for this public um continuation um what we do have now is the um final peer review from berkshire design group which we appreciate so um um berkshire design you can briefly address if you would like i mean certainly almost all of the um, concerns have been addressed. And so we certainly don't need to go through those, but uh, that's Lucy, Ms. Conley. Yes. Lucy Conley from Berkshire Design Group. Um, yes, so um, as you said, all of the comments have been addressed except for uh, one comment on uh, landscaping where uh, the applicant is requesting a, a waiver and I also left the lighting comment um, half open uh, in case the board had comments on the lighting since it came in a little later, but um, we didn't see anything uh, regarding the lighting that uh, was was uh, didn't didn't meet your requirements. Okay. Um, other members of the planning board, did you? Oh well. Um, Mr. Mr. Furman, if you'd like to address anything briefly now, and then if the planning board has questions uh, for either Mr. Furman or Ms. Connolly. Uh, hi, good evening. John Furman, uh, office manager for VHB in Springfield. And we've worked with uh, Lucy and Berkshire Design to get through all the comments. And I believe her summary is accurate. Every comment regarding stormwater, the site design, lot coverages, and uh, Clarifications of a few details have have been addressed. Uh, we had talked about the landscaping request at the last meeting. Uh, I don't believe we received a, uh, a response from the board on it, but we're basically looking to see if, uh, because of the, the the project is going to have a, another phase in the immediate future of a building addition, uh, which would have landscaping with it. We'd like to save the landscaping for that portion of it. 
additionally, at the last meeting, we had provided response, responses in our, in our cover letter for all of the green performance standard items there. Um, and I guess the board had a packed agenda and we didn't go through those. So those are all available to discuss as well. But in general, uh, it, it appears as if we meet all of the standards. Um, we're not cutting any trees. We're not on agricultural land. The site is zoned uh, industrial. Uh, there's no building associated with this phase of it. Uh, and, and we, if you just go through the, the letter, the responses are all there. And I, and I believe we meet all of those. So uh, what we're hoping to do tonight is to actually uh, get a, uh, an approval from the board if possible. So then we can, we're gonna go into our next phase, which is to file with the Conservation Commission uh, with the hope that Berkshire Design will review that application as well. That actually is a question that I did have because on 5481 of the peer review letter, which is on the bottom of page two, there is mention um, that a small portion of the embankment fill falls within the 100 foot buffer um, <clears throat> to a bordering vegetated wetland requiring filing notice of intent with Conservation Commission. So you are planning on going before the Conservation Commission. We are. There was initial discussion with the uh, the assistant town administrator that uh, the area within that 100 foot buffer is only about 75 to 100 square feet. And in comparison to the large amount of area that we have, uh, we might be able to do that with a request for determination of applicability. But the issue is, is that the wetlands have not been verified yet. So if we have to go through that effort of having the wetlands verified through a peer reviewer, then we're, oh, and the commission approving the wetland lines, we might as well just go through the NOI process because the two go together anyway. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> let's see, we have, I'm trying to think back and planning board, you can help me with this. Um, this is a continuation of our public hearing. We did have public comments before. Um, maybe we could ask if there are any further comments from the public, at which point then we would close the public. The, the tricky part, and actually Ken Camilla, our planning consultant from Pioneer Valley, um, planning commission can help us with this because my understanding is is once we have public comment period closed we can't have input from either uh, Berkshire design the peer reviewer or the applicant is that correct can't Ken that's correct okay so let's not close it yet so Good, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, Denise, do you see if there are any comments either on Zoom or in the um, no. hall for from the general public? Uh, there's there are no general public. No one, no, there's Chris. Chris Larrabee is here. Hi, Chris. All right, no, no other general public, thank you. Um, okay, so um, uh, can we have some discussion? in response and back and forth potentially with the applicant or peer review about the landscape design issue? Certainly, I, I can start that off. Is the, uh, the, the parking lot currently has two planters on the ends of the parking rows and uh, they are used for parking spaces versus landscaping. They, uh, the parking area is just so small that uh, everybody just parks on top of it. Uh, so we are, uh, if we, uh, our plan is to basically leave that the way that it is, cut the paving along the existing drive aisle and expand the parking lot closer or uh, in the direction of, of Route 5 and 10, giving us additional 61 spaces. Um, it, it, during the site walk that we had, uh, I pointed out how the area where we're putting the parking area is much lower than the current parking area. So we're bringing in fill in order to build that parking area up. So there will be a side slope that's vegetated outside of that of that parking lot. So uh, the the parking area is set back quite a bit of distance from the roadway. It's adjacent to an existing parking lot that has minimal landscaping, and uh, the uh, need for the the facility itself, the building, to expand 
There's been studies on that, looking at uh, expanding the existing building or just leaving that building currently the way it is and bringing in a new one on the end of this current parking lot that we have right now. And the thought process is, is that that would be a future uh, project uh, immediate uh, in the immediate future um, because they they have some growing space. So uh, they, so the, the thought is, is that uh, if we can close this and get this parking area built, the next phase would be the construction of that new building, the parking lot or the parking spaces that are parallel parking on the end of the parking lot would be turned 90 degrees and we'd basically double the size of them and the building would put right there and then we would have all landscaping along that. So plans are wonderful. We all know what plans can be and we hope that those plans come to fruition. But if those plans to then continue to expand don't come to fruition, um the parking the landscaping plan as it is right now is just the expanded parking lot in the area that it's in right now is <laughs> i mean right yep. so, yeah if we had to add landscaping we would not expect that we would be losing parking uh, to put landscaping in. If we had to landscape in, of anything, we would add it to the embankment that is building up the parking area and around the detention basin to provide some ground cover there. Uh, it, it just, it doesn't make any sense to, to add it now because uh, with a construction project looming, it, it has a chance of being damaged. And, and the Facility desperately needs parking. So we're trying to maximize whatever we can. Planning board, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, hi, here? this is Rachel Blaine. Um, I, I concur. I think that the idea of doing a planting landscaping, because that's what we require when you know that this is a growing business that is really looking to expand. It's the parking is gonna barely cover what they need right now. And, uh, I, I just, it doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a, it's not, they're not, because they're not taking trees down. I don't feel no. as pressed about requiring it. No, Annalie, I, I agree with that as well. And I mean, if, if there's a big concern, there could be a condition that if the, if it's not built, if yes. the building is not built within a certain period of yes. time that they then would have to put in landscaping. And that's fair. That, that's absolutely fair. Okay. Are there other comments? It's a little hard for me to see the... Uh, um, Emily? Were you... Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was going to um, agree, I think, and I think it's totally appropriate to put in a year condition, not a year, but some number of years condition. Um, and I'm just, there's been a lot of talk of this new building. Is the new parking lot going to be large enough for the expanded building? Or are we going to be having this conversation again when that happens? Uh, well, uh, the hope is, is that we currently exceed the parking that's required by zoning. And the, 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 the way the parking number was derived was because of projections made by the business and, and VESH. Um, those parking projections were made on expanding the building that we currently had to uh, the size that they want to build. So if we, build a new building, uh, the old building would be converted into um, a supporting use. Like, um, you know, uh, if an animal has surgery and it needs a, for lack of a thing, a bed for the night, it would go into I that building. It. You know, I, I don't know what the correct terminology is, but that's what it would be used for. It would not be a use that would generate people coming there. It would be support to this. So, the since Vesh uh, calculated the number of spaces that they thought they would need, we feel very confident that when we build the new building, this will th th this will be sufficient. In addition, like I said, the the end of the parking has six, I believe it's six parallel mm -hmm. parking spaces. And when we build the building, we would turn those 90 degrees. So we would turn that six into 12. Right. So we would actually have a few more parking spaces. In anyway because of it so 
So this is Kathy Wachoba. I just have a quick, quick question. So is there an anticipated size of this new building relative to the current building that's there, right? So if you're thinking about, is it three times the size of what's there as it relates to how much parking will be needed? Uh, the the numbers that have been thrown out for the concept planning are are between twenty and thirty thousand square feet as a building. I don't know the current size of the existing building off the top of my head, okay. but it's it's probably double that. That other building is probably fifteen thousand right now, twenty somewhere on there. Okay. But the new building will be if if you're familiar with the old building. Mm -hmm. it's just been added on so many times. It's now, I don't even know what shape to call it anymore. It's just, mm -hmm. so it'll, it'll just be, uh, the, the new building will be rectangular and uh, be, be more functional. Annalie, we're seeing a dog. <laughs> <laughs> but now you're seeing uh, potential conditions. Um, Ken, our planning consultant and I spoke some today um, Ken certainly has been part of this project from the pre-submittal meeting onward, right, Ken? Um, and um, so maybe, Ken, if you want to um, uh, maybe lead us through, these are three potential conditions that uh, very much are consistent with what we were just talking about. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, as Annalie mentioned, <clears throat> I did speak with her this afternoon and um, offered some um, conditional language um, for your approval um, in that number one is pretty typical of some communities that just want to ensure that if there are any changes to the plan after approval that the um, applicant would come back um, and ensure that they um, at least bring it to the attention of the board. Number two, um, and I heard some comments with regards to um, how to address, uh, oh, sorry, that's number three. Um, number two is the um, additional perming, permitting that would be required as um, both um, the applicant and the um, peer reviewer identified. Um, as far as next steps for this particular project. So this is just ensuring that this is stated in the permit um, that uh, the planning board would ensure that this get filed with the notice of intent or if, um, you know, if Mr. Furman wants to suggest a, a RDA, then, you know, that language could be put there. Um, and then number three is the, um, the waiver request um, that the applicant has identified as um, something um, for the board to consider. Um, and this, this is basically just stating that any future permitting of the site shall require a landscaping plan. Um, I think also the board, there were some board members that identified a time frame. If there is no action for a future phase of this, then maybe, um, you know, there would be a requirement where um, landscaping is installed, uh, whether or not that would require the applicant to come back to the board to present a landscaping plan um, versus just installing, you know, some additional plantings, I think that's a conversation for the board. Um, but these are, I think, just um, basically um, just confirm um, what has been presented in the in the um, peer review letter. Um, and um, I think as Anna Lee had mentioned, um, is what the board has been talking about as far as um, adding some additional uh, conditions to the approval. So for this first condition here that we're basically saying, um, if there's any material change to the uh, to the plans uh, that they need to come back to the plan. Do we need, can I, I just add, um, given a recent um, complication, do we need to add in their language that um, requires the applicant to, if, if peer review is necessary, 
and this is, I'm just mm -hmm. kind of covering our, our bases. Since recently we paid for a peer review of a project, there was no bond. So would we want to add that in there as well? If it was, if peer review was required for any changes, and, and I'm sorry, Mr. Furman, this is no reflection on your presentation or what I hear you saying. I'm just kind of trying to think about this condition as uh, even one step a little further. Hmm. Um, this is a parking lot. I'm not worried about it, but I think as a feature of that condition, because that's a pretty standard condition. That's not. Could, uh, could I interject for a minute yes. on that? Yeah. Um, I think the one thing that we haven't talked about in the whole process is the stormwater piece of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I'm assuming that since the planning board is the administrator of the stormwater, that along with that, there's some, I know that there's a, a maintenance operation and maintenance yeah. agreement. Yeah. Um, some communities have a bond associated with the stormwater piece of it to make sure that it gets uh, uh, constructed and um operational in the same amount of time. Um, is is there a, a, a meeting? I, I mean, are these meetings going uh, uh, together uh, through the process um, where we should be talking about that approval as well? Yes. So um, does that stormwater have a bond associated with it? Because I, 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 some communities do, some communities don't. I'm kind of thinking we should. I, we just have this. Mm -hmm. In general, we don't have a blanket bond. Um, we have been, as as Rachel was saying, um, <laughs> burned a bit about not requiring bonds or not following up when bonds are required. So we are being a little bit more vigilant about that right now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can help us here with... Um, I was trying to look at your zoning bylaw to see if... Um, there was a requirement based on um, what kind of standards you may have in either the stormwater authority or um, as the planning board during a site plan approval. Um, sometimes the boards rely on, if you have in your bylaw, um, section 44 or chapter 44, section 53G, which allows the board to um, hire outside um, basically review parties um, at the offset. So, um, you know, they're typically it's worded in a way uh, that would say that the applicant um, would board the cost of that. Um, but I don't see any issue with including, you know, some language regarding the bond, um, especially um, as you're also overseeing um, the stormwater permit. Um, so presumably you can add language here. I'm looking for both um, through your zoning bylaw and your general bylaw, um, but then also just looking for language that maybe um, you can include in your condition. Uh, so applicant would bear the cost of any subsequent peer review or anything well, else? The thing is, I think that um, as Mr. Furman pointed out, this is, Stormwater is com more complicated. This one is relative to any change that they might make. That's what I was thinking, but the stormwater is probably more uh, pertinent. So that it would be just part of number one. Yeah. Um, so it would be uh, applicant would bear the cost of any subsequent peer review needed to. Um, Right, triggered by the change. Needed, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Triggered by any change, change to the existing, any material change, extension or alteration. Is that kind of it? Applicant will bear the cost of any subsequent peer review triggered by any changes as noted above, or is that? Too late. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
We're all nodding, Annalie. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've never. That's yeah, that's fine. We could just okay. copy from the part. From... And then um, number two, as stated in uh, letter, the, well, um, so we're saying that the notice of intent shall be filed with the conservation um, commission prior to construction of the expanded parking lot. Your I, plan, I, right? I would think you, you'd want to modify that to basically say that required the filing of a notice of intent with the Conservation Commission and issuance of an order of conditions prior to the construction. Mm -hmm. without, without that, we don't have a project, so. An issuance of order of conditions. Yeah, prior to construction. Uh, okay, so we've got that. This should be satisfied prior to the construction. Yeah. That, that's good. Okay. Yep. Um, listen, before we do the landscape, then we were back there. We, we, we were having some discussion about the stormwater bond or uh, uh, protections for the town. <laughs> um, so it, it comes, the, my experience with other communities is, is that it's, it's twofold. It comes with an operation and maintenance agreement that the applicant um, executes between the town. And, and basically, um, if the town doesn't have any examples of that, I can provide some that we have created for other towns. And it basically says that uh, we, the applicant, promise to build what's on these plans and uh, this is how we're gonna maintain them. And then the applicant signs it, uh, the planning board chair signs it, and then they record it at the registry of deeds. And that's the agreement that is made between the two. So that's, when we're on the site walk, that was one of the questions is that we have all these stormwater things in town that don't get maintained, how do we know this one will? Right. And the difference is that you now have an agreement. Right. Now, you have in um, part of your materials to us some best management practices, but those are fairly superficial. It, it is. So those are basically uh, uh, how to handle the site during construction. And those are inspections that the, the site is not large enough to require a filing with the EPA for a, a general permit for construction because uh, the, the disturbance is under an acre. Uh, if we had a site that was over an acre, you'd have to file that permit, and then that requires a stormwater pollution prevention plan. Uh, so because we don't need a stormwater pollution prevention plan, those uh, items were put in our stormwater management report to give the contractor guidance on how to manage the site during construction and the inspections that he needs to perform. So that that is a direction for the contractor, but that's not the operation and maintenance. Right, okay. Um, so... Ken or John, but um, in terms of, I, I think it would certainly give me comfort to have a, an agreement such as John was mentioning previously about, you know, in relation to ma maintenance of this, of the stormwater plan, or Lucy, you're, you're nodding, what might you suggest as um, uh, any of you? Uh, um, verbiage for this and i'll speak at once <laughs> yeah. well it, go ahead oh, yes lisa lucy Ms. well Tom? i i as i recall um in the stormwater report john you had a you had an operation and maintenance for the storm scepters and correct and you also had a a sheet with the uh, like a, a checklist that the person maintaining it would use. That's that's exactly right. But the agreement that goes with that it was not present. So if, if I could suggest the the you know uh, I I could put together a draft agreement and the operation and maintenance procedures that go with it. Uh, I could forward certainly forward that to Lucy to have her give that a, a quick review. And uh, to Ken uh, also, if you want, and then that would be something for the the board to to, to sign. Okay, so we, that we would jointly sign at an operations. What's the name of it? It's, it's operation. called an operation and maintenance agreement. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I'd run. Um, yeah. which, in, which would include um, at a minimum annual reporting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It has annual reporting, uh, inspection requirements, uh, the maintenance to be done for each of the of the infrastructure that that's on the site, um, and uh, uh, a yearly reporting to the uh, stormwater authority of, of what was done. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh well, that yeah. So, which includes inspection requirements, um, maintenance. Um, yeah. Do I have this here? <clears throat> maintenance. Um, maintenance. Yep. And yearly reporting to the stormwater. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Or just put it. Just put includes inspection requirements since some of them are are more frequent maybe maybe more frequent than what yearly that's that's oh. that's good yep yeah okay <laughs> now then back to the uh landscape uh issue board i we had talked some about a time frame Uh, I, I would think that the, the conversations that I'm having with Vesh, that they're they're pretty gung ho on this, so that I would think that within the year I will be under design for uh, a building, and within two years uh, it would be submitted to you for approval. Yeah. So if it extends beyond two years, then we can require an updated landscaping. Yep. Yep. I think that's fair. So how would I put that here? Any, any. So if uh, plans for future building not submitted to the planning board within two years, an updated landscaping plan will be required. Which is perfect because it's important you can see what they really actually need for landscaping. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yes. Sorry for that. <laughs> All righty. Um, so uh, let's see. While we still have uh, open discussion with Mr. Furman and Ms. Conley, does the board have any other questions? And and with Ken, does the board have any other um, questions or points for discussion? Um. Do we want just like a little overview of the lighting since that was submitted from Mr. Furman? Would that be? I, I can provide that. Am I able to share a screen? Sure. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, Chris, is he able to share the screen? I'll, I'll do my stop share now just as I go. Yeah, that should be fine. So the uh, uh, you should be seeing the lighting plan uh, that was updated and submitted as part of the response to comments. So the initial uh, response or the initial comment really had two parts. The first was was that the layout that is shown uh, scaled back underneath did not match the current site plans, and that was because that lighting layout was done when addition was proposed to this building. And the, really the only difference to it was, was that there were bothered lights. The building kind of came out this way and there were pedestrian uh, bothered lights along that. So, um, so we did two things. The first was that we submitted the uh, updated uh, site plans <clears throat> to the engineer, to the electrical engineer or electrician on site who used his uh, uh, on-site reviewer to update the plan. 
the, the other thing we did is that we provided the uh, the bylaw uh, to that designer uh, so that they could comply with that. And your bylaw basically states that the the, the poles, um, you know, cannot exceed I think 14 feet or 10 feet on a four foot base. That's what we we have here, and that's what the design is based on. So all of these uh, lights here, which you can see are on the perimeter and in this area here are the new lights that are proposed. They're, um, they're all single headlights. Uh, they are an LED fixture. I believe the, uh, um, the pole is a, a, a bronze pole, but they're all downcast so that there's no, uh, no spillover. When you look at the foot candle representation, um, in looking, if you recall this part, this, this property, it's massive compared to the area of the development. So you can see the, the, the numbers don't go very far beyond what we have developed and they're all zero. So we have ba basically have zero light spillage off the property because the property lines are way down here. Thank you. So we feel we, we comply with your requirements. Okay. Questions, planning board? Okay. Um, so um, then does the, is the planning board in agreement that we would close public comment and have any further discussion if we need? Yes, I vote, I move that we close public comment. That's Rachel Blaine. I second that, Denise Mason. Okay, uh, Emily, starting with you and around the table. Emily Gaylord, yes. Kathy Wichroba, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Emily Wolf, cool, yes. So we'll close public comment now and um, come back here to our conditions. I don't think there's anything at this point, maybe. <clears throat> um, so, uh, planning board, any discussion about any of the four of these conditions? that we have proposed? Yeah. No, doesn't seem like it. No. All right, so I guess what I would be looking at then is a motion to approve the site plan application for the uh, VESH for Vesh, um, with the uh, conditions as noted here. Not, not the slight plan, but the site plan. <laughs> I make a motion to approve the site plan with the conditions stated above. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Oh, second, seconded by- I second. Yes. That was- she was, she was poised. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Denise moves. Kathy second. Excellent. Uh, and further discussion. Okay. Uh, I do have a question. I oh, do. a question. Not, Kathy, it's not necessarily say. related to this, but I just I wonder say. about our green bylaws. And mm -hmm. we are doing a lot of these, and we never seem to talk about well, the pervious pavement and. We did yeah. that. That was that was addressed when we did the site visit with Mr. Furman. We okay. did talk about that. Okay, I wasn't there, so thank you. Know, you. It, it's yeah. I mean, Mr. Furman, do you want to? No, I he, unfortunately since we've closed, uh, uh, um, but so I can, no, think that, I can, that has been addressed. Yeah, but okay. I think, do you want me to tell you what sure, I what I, I just, think, and it, I'll look at Mr. Furman, and you can <laughs> smile if I get it right. Um, and if not, well, so. <laughs> um, that pavement with the amount of traffic that is going to the lot, it will not hold up. And mm -hmm. so it's actually going to create an environmental, a negative we environmental did. impact in, um, that. rather than a improvement. It came okay. up in, in discussion. It came up in discussion. Mm -hmm. And it is the problem with this pervious pavement and it's gonna happen again and again. Uh, I think it's something we wanna maybe look into us, like figure out what it is because we're, we're hot for it, but it makes no sense. <laughs> 
So, um, and I, you know, I, looking at building projects that I'm involved in, uh, we're not using well, it either. So you know. I think it's something really important to, for us to understand, like it's the concept of it is great, but mm -hmm. it has very particular at this point in New England, especially very particular and application. I, I think um, at the site visit, it was also explained that the way that the lot is set up will reduce right. any of the environmental impact that the yes. lot would have. I do think to your point in terms of green requirements and things like that, we might just want to look at them in general. And there's things other than pavement that we could be looking sure. at as a mm -hmm. metric to well, try and ensure yeah. more Green sustainable. Roof. I think I also recall Mr. Freeman saying that the um, character of the soil underneath the pavement is so, so clay, so firm that nothing would be <laughs> pervious. It wouldn't be going through it. Right. Is that just smiling? Is he yes, smiling? He is smiling. <laughs> he said we were good students. We were all good students <laughs> in school. We listened. I just want to make a comment that in both Mr. Furman's presentation and also the site visit, that you were very clear and it was very easy to understand everything that you said. So yeah. we do appreciate that. Mm -hmm. As well, um, the coordination between Berkshire Design and the applicant. Um, really appreciate the work that you did to put this in a way that made sense to all of us. <laughs> all right, um, any other discussion, planning board? Okay. All right, so um, then let's have a vote. Uh, Emily? Emily Gaylord, yes. Kathy Wittroba, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Emily Wolfkull, yes. So the um, site plan is approved with the following conditions and we'll be asking Amy to um, write up, there's a formal decision form that needs to be filed. And if she needs any assistance with that, Ken can assist her with that. Do we need to approve the stormwater? We have the... Uh, elaborate there, Rachel, what are you yeah. saying? Stormwater. Oh, that's separate. Stormwater. Oh, good point. Uh, yeah, I think we do. Don't. I'm. I'm pretty sure we do the stormwater application, and and there also. I mean, the special permit was uh, folded into the site plan application. I don't know if we need to do anything special with that, but um, yes. Yeah, so. Um, could I have a motion to approve the stormwater permit application? I make a motion to approve the stormwater permit uh, application. With Kathy, with Sol condition. condition number. Yeah, potentially. I mean, it seems like what we're talking about is uh, that this condition number four actually is a condition for the stormwater Storm. permit, right? Yeah, I second Rachel Blaine. Okay, so wouldn't, I mean, to some degree, it seems that um, both number four and number one, which says if there's any material change in the application that um, it needs to be brought back before the, <clears throat> the planning board, that that would apply for the stormwater permit as well. Yep. Okay. So, so we would be saying for our um, stormwater conditions, it would be number one and number four. Number four. Yep. And then for our um, site plan review, it was one, two, and three. Correct. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we did have a motion and a second. Is that correct? Yep. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Any further discussion? No. Okay, Emily, you're on the hot seat for the first one always. <laughs> Emily Gaylord, yes. Kathy Wichoba, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Ace Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Emily Wolfkull, yes. So um, we will, we assume, uh, approve the stormwater application as well. Thank you for a good catch on that one, Rachel. Um, Ken and planning board, we seem to be okay on this. We're ready to move on. All right. So Ms. Conley and um, I think Mr. Furman, is, well, both of you might be staying on anyway for the next discussion as well as Ken. All right, thank you very much. 
Um, so, um, whoa, 754, ooh, which is, time for us to move and groove here. Um, so our next discussion on the agenda is, um, is um, that we do have our continuation of our public hearing for the Sunny Days uh, facility, um, site plan review and stormwater. Um, just as an aside, I think the site visit is still trying to be scheduled, but you know, potentially it's maybe if we can tromp through mud instead of tromp through snow, it might be a little bit easier. So Amy's gonna work on that. Um, uh, this is a continuation of our public hearing. We did have, um, first of all, I really appreciate that uh, to see this sort of work in progress between Berkshire Design and the applicant. Um, I think that's really helpful for us to get a, our hands around what um, is, is actually going on. Um, uh, I know I have a few questions in relation to the uh, the here the sort of the work in progress letter that came forward, but um, uh, planning or uh, maybe very briefly again, um, Ms. Conley and Mr. Furman, if you have any um, introductions that you want to have to this um, beginning of the process. Well, um, I'll summarize the the letter. In general, comments one through ten were directed at the uh, the special permit uh, document, and um, most of them are clarifications of what's in that document. Um, so, uh, and and uh, John's responses um, uh, uh, go go to go to that clarification. Okay. So, I think for comments one through ten, it's just a matter of whether it's it's necessary or uh, not to revise that document, or or I think that the responses uh, clarify uh, those those uh, comments. Then comments 11, 12, and thirteen are to do with um, parts of the the code that uh, have um, that there are questions on. So for eleven. Um, those are certain criterion that, that are supposed to be addressed for the special permit process. 12 are the, those green criteria that we, that we were just speak, that you were just speaking of for the other project. And 13 um, are some, some additional uh, things that go along with a special with site plan review, I think, uh, specific, plan specifications. And then the remainder of the comments, are on the stormwater report. Um, and those uh, 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 John is working on, uh, most of those are being our work in progress. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think in response to one of the things you mentioned uh, with the first 10, um, similar to what you've done previously, if uh, Berkshire Design could say whether or not their response uh, satisfies your concern. And, and that would be the, the back and forth. And... Sure. Okay. Yep. On numbers one through 10, does anyone on the planning board have any specific um, concerns um, for those questions? Um, I, I was thinking with, I, I believe it's number eight when they were talking about the, um, I think it's number eight, it's really hard to tell here, with the odor, odor yeah, the yeah. odor mitigation plan, which does require certain um, filters that that might be part of a, of a condition or part of a best, best practices checklist. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd, I'd like to first I'll introduce uh, Ken Boquillen, who's in the bottom here. He's the applicant, uh, and so he's able to answer anything uh, of the marijuana type processes and, and of the plant himself. 
uh, you know, he's, he's the guy that's going to build it. He's going to run it. So uh, I just, if there's any questions that the board have with respect to anything that in that one through 10, um, he's, he's the guy to answer it. Um, <clears throat> but it, in, in general, one of uh, Lucy's comments uh, where uh, on the marijuana stuff, the way it was presented, it, it seemed <laughs> like it was like out of order, out of sequence. And my response to clarify that was we cut those sections out of the zoning code and then we sent them to Ken and his partner and they put together a nice package and they nicely numbered everything one through 10, but it didn't fit the process of the zoning code. So VHB took it apart and moved it around. So it went in order. Yeah. So now you'll see like page 22, 23, then it goes to 30, then it goes back to 25. So it appears as if pages were missing. That's totally our fault, but we, what we tried to do was organize it in a way that followed your zoning code. So we understand uh, that. Thank you. Us. Yep. Uh, planning board, do you have any other comments in relation to number one through 10? Okay. Um, then um, in relation to 11, 12, and 13, um, which does talk about the the traffic study, um, utilities, especially, um, <clears throat> CONCOM's involvement with impacts on the natural environment. Questions, yes, comments? Yes. If the chair uh, is uh, agreeable, I could splash that memo up on the screen and we could go through them quickly to show those out. Well, I don't think we need to go through this. Sure, you can go ahead. Um, well, no, I'm good with it. I'm just, <laughs> yeah. uh, if, you, if you don't need to, I'm fine without doing it. Um, <laughs> in, well, sure, in general, you can go ahead for um, 5322, which talks about the, the traffic safety plan. Um, I know you've addressed it to some degree, but I am concerned that uh, the data used in the traffic safety plan was from 2016, which is before Treehouse, before our VESH expansion. Um, and that doesn't feel quite adequate. <laughs> so we, we, have, we have done uh, traffic counts. And the, the problem is, is that when we started this project, COVID still wasn't yet winding, winding down. So uh, MassDOT um, has set a standard for traffic studies. Um, and that standard is continuing until someday we're officially out of COVID. But so basically 2016 was, was really uh, the last year that projects in the area had adequate traffic counts. So what MassDOT is allowing is you to take those counts and then grow them at a percentage per year. And the percentage is heavy. Most communities grow traffic at a percent to a percent and a half a year. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, the, and the percentage is, is, is grown along those lines to adequately show what is, um, what is, is, is current. Um, uh, we, uh, because the five and 10 is a, is a, a fairly major highway, this facility will generate, uh, minor traffic. Uh, the, the, the highest piece of traffic that'll be generated is the dispensary and the dispensary is really only about uh, 900 square feet. It's not, it's not very large. The third party testing and the cultivation, those are employees. So they're going to come in and then they're going to leave. They're not going to generate trips. The dispensary is the is is the big item. And I believe when we uh, did the traffic analysis from ITE, we coupled that with uh, actual data that VHB has collected for marijuana type uses, uh, so that we could get a conservative amount. So the traffic being generated by this entire campus is minor compared to the volume of traffic that's on the roadway. Okay. Well. I, I, I mean, I think for part of the just discussion right now for you to consider moving forward, at least to some degree, is as you talk about, you know, growing this, growing the statistics moving forward, if you could make sure that you're taking into account 
the changes in the environment, which especially has to do with touring house, which might be having traffic at the same time that people will be coming to the dispensary. Yep, so that's understood. Yep. Remember that. And one <laughs> small comment from from us on the on the um, on the traffic is that. Um, uh, we should check that the sight distance is acceptable at, at, onto Route 5 from that driveway. But uh, the the thing is that, that there will be a, a DOT uh, access permit and they will be checking that sight distance. So that they are very careful with that. So that will get addressed by that permit. I just wanted to bring that up. Okay. Um, 50, 5325. Can I just, so DOT approves the site, the curb cut they have yes to, yes we, we actually have three permits from dot we have one for the water line extension we have one for the access and then we have one for the utility extension uh utility connections i should say i just, I just have a question about the traffic and, and forgive me but is there a way of getting a more recent study or asking for one i'm just a little like treehouse to a community like deerfield is a much different infrastructure increase than like other communities that bring in new business like it's a huge traffic generator and I'm just I know that this is going to be a sticking point for the community is understanding what the implications of this are going to be on traffic and so the more information we can have up front and the more secure we feel in it I think it's going to alleviate a lot of headache down the line we we did uh, uh updated traffic counts for uh the project next next door that you all just heard um so we can compare the projections that we made in this study to the actual counts that we got that on the roadway and, and then you can helpful. you can get a, a a comparison that way thank you any other traffic questions or uh, discussion i do this is kathy with Trevor. So the facility will generate minimal traffic as it relates to the dispensary, but it's also going to generate traffic as it relates to the materials on and off site. Um, and it seems to be unclear what that volume of traffic is. And so what I'm seeing um, is um, a section of five and 10 becoming pretty heavily developed, which is so great. Um, but if there's some minimal traffic concerns with a dispensary, what is the, what is the volume of materials coming on and off site as well? Or that this might be something then for you to address in the future. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. there's two, there's two things happening with the traffic as it relates to this site. It's people coming on and off as as for the yeah as customers for the, the dispensary but then there's also traffic coming on and off site for materials so some are you know regular vehicles and others are probably more larger vehicles than that i would imagine if if i could share my screen i can probably answer that right now mm -hmm. I, i'd like to understand more about what the question what materials are are, are you you know, well, questioning. According to this, I quoted marijuana materials. So request information on delivery of marijuana materials on and off site. So that's what, that's your product, correct? Yeah. So all of our product is, is made on site in the cultivation facility. It is then sold at the dispensary or across the state. There's no product being brought onto our into our so we we're a single source company so we're not a company that goes and buys product and manufactures it and resells it we are strictly a single source company we produce everything in-house the client knows where every product came from it came from us this is exactly what we've done in other states this is how we do it i'm just reading off of this sheet number nine i mean i'm taking it right sure. off your own literature so my my question remains yeah. Okay, go ahead. Let, yeah, let me if I could share my screen, I think we can we can answer uh, sure. that. So uh, the way that uh, uh, the traffic um, generation is is compiled is uh, through uh, the Institute of Transportation Engineers ITE, and they have different land use codes. They have 
a land use code for a marijuana dispensary. They have a land use code for cultivation. Could you just zoom in for us um, a little bit. There's sure. It, uh, it looks big on my screen. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. All right. All right. Is that better? Yes. All right. Well, now I can't lie to you because now you can see the numbers. So, <laughs> um, so, so, so the two things have happened here. So, uh, ITE uh, has provided some fairly decent numbers for the cultivation and the research and development piece. When they look at a cultivation facility, they look at uh, vehicles coming in and vehicles going out. So, the vehicles going out would be employees. It would be the occasional um, uh, uh, van with uh, marijuana going out, and then it would be a, 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 a delivery coming in, which might be the information or the, the materials that are used to, to grow the plants or the minerals or whatever they do. Uh, Ken can maybe elaborate on that, but that's all included in this land use code. So this number captures all of trips going in and out. Same thing with the research and development. So uh, on a third party testing lab, um, I'm assuming what's going to happen is that you're going to have uh, people who are taking stuff elsewhere and they're going to want to test it here and they're bringing that in or the, the stuff that's grown here on site is going to be tested here. And then um, the, so and, but that's more of like an office setting that is um, uh, basically people reporting there. The marijuana dispensary is the one that has uh, kind of generated the most uh, discussion of, of late because the ITE uh, mm -hmm. manual hasn't, uh, there isn't enough, um, there isn't enough occurrences within the, the state to actually have accurate data. Uh, if you look at the ITE, the ones that they're citing are out in Colorado where it was first legal. So what a lot of the traffic engineers are doing is they're doing their own traffic counts at facilities that are already open and using that data, which is a, a, a more conservative way to do it. So the way that we did our traffic generation is that we took all these three items, two from ITE, one from our record data, and then we analyzed them based on the square footage of the facility. And they look at peak hours. Uh, so what this tells you is that during the peak hour, which is generally seven to nine, uh, we will have 55 vehicles on the roadway from this facility, 33 entering the site and 22 exiting. During the weekday evening, we'll have 146, uh, which means that we'll have 66 entering the facility, 80 exiting. And uh, during the Saturday peak hour, which is more towards midday, we will have a, a pretty even split, 125, 62 entering and 63 exiting. So those are what we, we gauge the impact of the roadway on. It's what, what impact does that have during the peak hours? During the rest of the day, there are cars coming and going, but it's it, it's the peak hours that generate the issues for the uh, for the roadway network, and these numbers, as I mentioned, are extremely low compared to the volume of cars that are already on Route Five and Ten. Hopefully, that provides some explanation. Okay, thank you. Um, well, if not, at our next meeting, we'll let you <laughs> let you know. Sure. Um, I would also think that with the amount of jobs that have been lost in Deerfield, just from just from the corporate y Yankee candle pulling out, they they'd be the town would be overly happy that we're building this facility that's going to bring in about sixty new jobs. Um, yes, although you have mentioned that there's not preference to Deerfield residents. Um, you, you've been very clear about that. Um, number 5325 on your, um, on your uh, Berkshire design um, report, <clears throat> um, it does, it, you're, you mentioned that Deerfield Conservation Commission will be made uh, a filing will be made in the immediate future. We'll want to make sure that that happens. That'll happen this week. Okay. We, we reviewed the draft of the notice of intent from our consultant uh, uh, today, actually. Uh, we, uh, Ken's partner, Brian, has signed the application. We forwarded those off to our consultant who's compiling all that report together. 
the plans and the stormwater are basically the same plans that the planning board is currently reviewing. And really all we're waiting for is our Watertown office to cut the checks. And once those get in, it's all being delivered. Um, so it may be for some of the additional comments that it might, in, in my mind, that these, because we are working on a little bit of a time constraint here, um, that these might be issues that you could make sure that, that you know that we may be concerned about and for you to address in the future. Sure. There, uh, knowing that you have a time constraint, there are uh, uh, one item that we want to talk about, which is the tree inventory and the, the, the tree yep, preservation. I, I do too. Um, 5481, um, you talk about fill. We always want to know how much fill. So at some point, you can let us know approximately how much fill you think you're going to be using. Sure. Um, anybody else up through 5481? Planning board. Um, well, and then that comes to the fact that you would be asking for a waiver of the tree inventory. I don't think that, uh, I mean, I think that's probably more comprehensive than what we'd be able to uh, discuss right now. But in general, we'd want to know the, the map, you know, a map of what's the area you're talking about, how many, what's the circumference of the trees that you're talking about taking away and. Well, yeah. And, and that's really why why we want to request a waiver of that because uh, you haven't had the benefit of site walk yet, but uh, the site is unique. It's got wetland fingers that run through it, so the, our area of disturbance is is limited to what we can fit within the 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 fingers of the wetland in between them, and then keeping a, a buffer between that and the wetland. So uh, what we've done is we've made our development as condensed as possible. Um, we have, uh, and I always get this number wrong, Ken, 28 right. acres between the two parcels? Correct. Right. And so it, it, so we have one parcel, uh, 15014, which we're developing on, and then I believe it's 157, which is the adjacent one, and we have no intention of going into that parcel. So, so uh, our, our, our opinion or, uh, of, the, of, the, of the bylaw is that it, it's, it's for if you have a one acre site, and someone comes in and clear cuts the entire one acre and and but when we have a forest the the amount of effort to go in and category all the trees in the five acres that we're proposing to develop is is a humongous effort we just because it's a forest if i so, can interrupt you sir um i think often we have taken into consideration not requiring a special tree inventory, I think the replacement piece for the ones that you are cutting down is something that we might be more interested in. But FYI, yes, it, it probably does not make sense to be inventorying everything on that side. That's it, would, it would take forever for, for that. And then on, on the replacement, our thought is, is that if we preserve the adjacent lot, we, we currently show no landscaping on this development either, because you, if you, when you look at the site, we have detention basins everywhere. We can't plant vegetation really on the detention basin berms because the roots go into those and then creates a hazard for that for, might be part yeah. of your uh, part of your yeah. request or the rationale for the request of the the yeah. waiver. Right? So um, should the request come now or because uh, we've made the request? So do well, you no, it would need to be some detail. I mean, it's not just we want to. Well, in my mind, I mean, I think it's more than, and maybe this is something that Berkshire Design could. Um, assist with in terms of the amounts of detail, but um, you know, when you talk about a waiver from the replacement bylaw, we don't even know what you're cutting down. So it's hard for us to know the scope of what we would be giving you a waiver on. <laughs> so we yeah. need a few more details, I think. I, I would just say um, in general, I would love more specificity in general in regards to a lot of the comments that were made. You know, it says it's going to be highly efficient. That's not actually a metric that we can lean on. It says, you know, that there's um, odor mitigation, but it's not really specific how that's going to happen. So, like, if we can just have more specificity regarding the trees, regarding the odor, regarding the efficiency of the building, I think that that's going to take us a long way. Sure. Okay. We'll try and put together uh, an official uh, document that kind of provides that. Okay. Yeah, and I think... Um... So I can give you guys a little bit of uh, insight and then and then John and I will provide some documentation for this. So when it comes to the efficiency of the building, so 
This building will be one of the first that you'll find in the state. So we're zero on-site fossil fuel, um, except for emergencies. So um, we recapture all the waste heat um, from the electrical components, and we use that energy um, to make heat, um, which is obviously the most expensive. Um, cooling is much cheaper than making heating. Um, so unlike most facilities where they have either propane or some other type or, or natural gas, um, we only have a propane tank for emergencies when all power goes out and everything is dead. Um, and that way that would fire up our generator and keep us running. The rest of the time when there's not a power outage, um, we will be burning zero on-site fossil fuel. Um, that's very hard to find in the United States right now. Um, we're one of the first companies doing it. Um, we will by certainly top the efficiency in the state of Massachusetts. Good. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. So, so most use propane, but you don't. So most pot dispensaries do, like most marijuana cultivation places? Cultivation. You're not talking in general. No, Just we're talking cultivation facilities. Yeah, okay. Yep. So dispensary uses very little energy. Um, it's just like a commercial space, yeah. like the one you're sitting in right now, um, yeah. uses very little energy. It's just cre uh, comfort, you know, creature comfort, and that's it. Um, right. When it comes to the cultivation, that's where we use more energy. Um, but of course, we conserve a lot of that energy, and we're getting away from fossil fuel on site. Um, so that's exactly what this administration and, and you know, the present day are looking for, and that's, right. that's what we do. When so, in comparison, when we were looking at um, Sun's Mass, yeah. it was propane. The propane um, storage was a huge feature of what we were looking at in terms of there. And so the, the purpose of the energy is for heat. The heat is to dry the leaves. I mean, there's sort of no, a no, effect. no, not even close. So okay. so cultivation yeah. facilities have a high dehumidification load. You have plants growing inside a building they're transpiring, um, they're growing, they're doing photosynthesis, there's lots of humidity. So we have to remove that humidity. So yeah. the dehumidification process, um, I'll ex explain it a little bit. You need to deep cool the air um, and, and that written to get to the dew point so you can wring the water out. And now you have cold air and you have to heat it back up before you send it back into the space. So we're conserving energy and grabbing waste heat uh, from LED lights uh, from the chillers, and we're making all that heat that we need um, for that reheat process, also to heat that building during winter months, um, and, and anything else that we need hot water for in that building. Okay, thank you. Thank all you. right, um, planning board, um, I think that Emily's comment in terms of, as this is obviously a document that is a work in progress, yeah. um, that we would like a lot more specificity, um, hopefully it was, uh, is the, the 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 word of the of the the day? Is there anything in particular um, that you would like to bring forward as a charge for Ms. Connolly and Mr. Flynn? Okay. Thank you, <laughs> and Chairman <laughs> and and Ken. I agree. Yes. Yeah, I and I can review uh you know, once once we get more detail on the tree, we, we can also if if you we can give opinions uh also on, on some of the other things on landscaping and um water reduction, some excellent. of these some of these uh pieces of the code. Right, excellent. That's that, that would be very helpful. As you so know. um we would be asking for um a continuation of the public hearing. Um uh, I would anticipate that our April meeting, you would have a fair amount of the back and forth, um, potentially. Uh, does that make sense? I think it's in yeah. April. Yeah, it does. We're working on stormwater right now. And uh, once we get to that, then all we really have left is the uh, items that we're talking about now, the okay. papers and the tree things. So um, Amy, our administrative assistant, will um, have the continuation form for us both sides to sign. And I think um, the continuation is the first Monday in April. I'm not sure what date that is. April 3rd. The 3rd? Yep, April 3rd at 6.30. <laughs> There we go. And hopefully that's our only public our only, yeah. <laughs> that's right. All right. Kind of lonely. You guys don't want to come in here and spend some time with us? <laughs> Very much. 
if the if the weather's good we will drive up yeah, yeah. i'll have to check the hours at treehouse first so yeah <laughs> okay all right um, thank you all thank you very much thank yeah. you Bye -bye. um so planning board maybe we can uh, be fairly quick on some of the other things um uh in comment to I'm thinking back who oh i know mr decker was wondering about our um our bylaws and um how sort of sketchy they are with what's been replaced what hasn't been whatnot um uh we did we have had now um both uh FERCOG and town of deerfield have signed our contract and memorandum of understanding um so that uh the 179 review will proceed with oh, that's great yes it's very great um Kate, uh Peggy Sloan, the uh, director of planning at FERCOG, um, wanted to meet with us individually to, to sort of lay out exactly more specifically what they would be doing and then also find out from us any specific questions or concerns that we have. Um, and that seems like that could be a fairly detailed conversation. So rather than have that, you know, delay our 179 review even more, wondering whether or not on um, March 27th, we might be able to just have a focus meeting with her and not have anything yeah. else. It may be, you know, 30, 45 minutes at yeah. most. Zoom. So you want to do, can we do it on Zoom? Zoom. Oh, absolutely. Ab oh, uh, Peggy, will, Peggy will be on Zoom. So yeah. It's better if we're all on Zoom, honestly, than yeah. hybrid. So mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm okay. All right. Okay. So we'll have it Zoom only uh on the 27th do you prefer six or 6 30 we could do either i will not be there That's, okay i have prior engagement oh, wait, wait, which which day is it uh the 27th monday the 27th i can do that i can do that yeah i guess i have to six 6 30 which um it says 6 p.m on here <laughs> well question mark at you because we're just edging okay. peggy can also do 6 30 on zoom i'm just saying there might be another board member there it's three and a half and demanding but you know as long is six as six <laughs> 30 better for everyone with getting home and having a little bit of dinner it what's does, that it doesn't matter. I, I, I can do anything I, I'll, i can do whatever other people want to do that's fine oh, i could be there so are we doing six <laughs> Well then, let's do six thirty. Send six thirty. Six thirty. I think six thirty is better. I think we just stick with that. Okay, six thirty. Six thirty. Okay. Um, I, I have a group I'm going with. It's already been done. So I'm going to kind of you can't touch that group. Okay. Um, I'll give a brief, um, a very brief update. Um. I think you all received the the uh, piece. Uh oh, uh -oh. we lost Annalee. How <laughs> come uh -oh. We're done. Hey, okay, vice chair, here we go. Annalee. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe her, I don't know. Um, She's in Vermont, so no, no. Anything can happen in Vermont. Yeah. Some moose ran into the. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> And then our next meeting after that is the third, just by the way. So it's just one week later. Right. So, well, and yeah, I'm just going to tell you, you're going to get these minutes. Hey, you're going to get these minutes by the end of this week. Amazing. I'm amazing and uh, okay. just saying, but well, I am dying. <laughs> and I'm not we'll loving it. Yeah, we'll talk. We'll so start. okay, so I looked at the next meetings, and then we've got annual town meeting four twenty four. My birthday. Oh. Annual I town election. Four twenty four. That's what you just said. Oh, you are. Yeah, my daughter, my son. Oh, right. <laughs> so the twenty fourth. Sorry, is yeah, annual town know, meeting. Yeah, and then the eighth is work on our, our meeting. We've got to change it because of town elections, right? Still working. Oh, she is. She's back. I'm back. back. I'm back. Yeah, we lost you. I know. I touched something. I'm sorry. Keep my hand. <laughs> um, you all received a, um, I believe, the uh, letter from the fire 
department fire chief who is concerned about uh, our set right road solar installation. So that is being investigated. I think we'll have some um, concrete information to uh, to give at our April meeting. Um, but it's a in my mind, it's a oh, you didn't receive that letter. No, it's no, in our yeah. it's in our oh, packet. Okay. Annalie, I was glad to see that because I'm glad to see that there is enforcement yeah. because that has been an issue yeah. with a lot of things. It's, you know, how do we follow up on it, on the enforcement? Yeah. Well, and it seems like yet again, another example of why having a planner, having someone, you know, overseeing a lot, of, you know, I mean, we've been trying to get an annual report even from Set Right Road for a year over, you know, whatever. And it hasn't happened. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, that's something that's it's so, as simple as putting on the calendar when we need to get a report right. and from whom. Right. And then someone just looks Building at Building a it. calendar so that you're. Yeah. Chick, 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 yeah. Chick. Right. I Which think I think you, we have. I mean, as somebody, one of you guys has, because we keep true. coming up with it. It's not, I know, but somebody has to do it. And it's. Right, right, right. Not straightforward. Yes. Okay. Um, let's let's hold on the planning board policy. Um, you know, FYI, man, the you know we're trying to get a planner through the budgeting process. If any of you have any ideas or want to come and talk at the finance committee meetings, um, coming to those. It you is. Know, I I would recommend. It's just it partially. Last year was so tense and. There was so much going on, but um, it was, I found it, I went a couple of times on behalf of, not behalf of myself mostly, but uh, I found it really enlightening and um, um, important to watch what they do and how they do it. Wait, which? Finance committee. Oh, the finance, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's, I, I was here, it was just, and in a funny kind of way too, um, speaking to an empty room right this minute uh it's nice to support them too mm -hmm. like you're there to say we believe what you're doing and rock on and keep up the good work and mm -hmm. thank you for making our town solvent but um i think it's good for us to have our presence there mm -hmm. uh it gives a little bit more body literally to the to the effort that we put in i mean we really i i I'm impressed with how much this job takes. I mean, really, I to do it badly, it takes a lot of time. It takes so, and I um, I just feel like anyway. Well, I, maybe we could set up like at least for me, it'd be easier if I didn't have to go every time. And maybe we could make like a rotation or one of right. us is there at each well, meeting. Well, I, I mean, I don't mind doing it for this, this, this go around. What happens is they, they just go like this. The finance committee is now on full. Mm -hmm. They're on, they're all there. They're all there all the time. They're so the they're on. Yeah. So this is their season. Mm -hmm. Unlike us, we're 12 months board. Right. Most yeah. boards or many boards are. Oops. Yeah. I'll try to find out from Casey. Oh. But when well, they might be discussing the planning, planning planner. I don't know when they're That's, doing that. Let you all know. Let you all know. I do watch. I watch the meetings, but I watch them after they happen on Zoom in the comfort of my own home. So I don't actually. I haven't come to the meetings, but I think the last meeting they were talking a lot, you know, about the police and about funding. And actually, that was yeah. a real eye opener. Right. It was a really interesting meeting. So I mean, I do. I look, watch select board meetings, finance, sometimes, you know, some yes, meetings. But what we need is for them to see us knowing that what they're doing is impacting us. Like, yeah, that's part of it. It's not, yeah. it, that was the only thing. And and I felt like it was enlightening to me, but it was also, I wanted them to see like, this is how much we care about it. We're not, right. we're not just sitting back and it's just one more thing to do, but it's also, right. So just well, looking at oh, I you can see. watch the CIPC meetings. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. I just had before this. Meeting. Yeah, I know. Yes, yes. No, which that's it's all good. Okay. okay. Um, I don't think there's anyone on uh, Zoom either for public comments, right? Any no. more for that? Okay. Should I make a motion? I would love to make a motion that we adjourn. <laughs> I, I already made that motion. Uh, you Rachel. did not. You seconded it. Okay. She who writes Hi. the memo, the notes, gets to decide who said what. <laughs> no <way>. <laughs> <laughs> Discussion. Did we have a second? We did have a second. All right, Emily. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, I, I have Molly Taylor. Point. Yes, got me oh, already oh, adjourned. Okay, good. And adjourned. <laughs> yes, happy yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good, good night. Everybody stay warm.